Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 1, Episode 19, titled Made For Each Other. A special Vice episode about our beleaguered boys on the B-team. This episode premiered on March 8, 1985. It was written by Alan Weisbecker and Joel Cernow. Alan Weisbecker, so th- I'm going to read off a list of episodes here, guys, that it be not impressed when we were starting this episode. Although, I'll say at the end, I think we can all agree this was a, a we, we, we were fans of this episode. Alan Weisbecker wrote the episode Glades. Jo- oh. <laughs> Joel <Okay>. Cernow. <laughs> yeah, Joel Cernow wrote Cool Running, Calderon's Return, Part 1 and 2, The Great McCarthy, and Little Prince. Okay, so Joel, I clearly yeah. respond well to. Like, that <laughs> That explains a lot about my feeling for this episode. <laughs> he also wrote, I didn't hmm. write him down, but there's some future episodes that he wrote that are great. He wrote Evan, which is we haven't watched yet, and then another episode uh, later in the run, which is called... Um, Lombard. The Place Where Buses Don't Run or something like that. So, Out Where the Buses Don't Run. Yeah, there we go. Before we get started, like to see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, we did not prep for this section, so I don't think we have anything to talk about with what's going on in each other's lives other than I now have a teenager, an official teenager in my house. Okay, but can we talk about this, like the real victims here with that? I'm having a crisis. She is a teenager. That means I'm old. Like, you can at least you- look at your infant daughter and lie to yourself <laughs> and pretend that maybe, like, you're still you're still young enough to have, like, you know, infant kids. No, I am getting old. You I was- realize that both of us are probably muted on her social media pages. <laughs> I-, I was telling her on her... Yeah, I'm I'm not exactly father of the year when it comes to keeping mindful of the things that I say out loud. So I did drop some bombs of like you're only a couple of years away from being tried as an adult uh, and similar things uh. along those lines. <laughs> 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 what, what fantastic fatherly advice that you just <laughs> I like that you assume that she is at risk of criminal behavior so you want to let her know <laughs> start saving for an attorney now <laughs> only a matter of time that is so that is so the result of our parents where it's like hey you can do what you want we're real cool but if you mess up I don't know you <laughs> you're, you're, you're on your own <laughs> well, alright guys let's get started on this episode I think we have a lot to talk about in this, so so let's hurry up and get started. This episode was a little bit of Three's Company meets like a dragnet. What I wanted to start with on this episode was talking about the director. First and foremost, I skipped over it in the opening. I normally that's where I talk about the director, but I skipped over him on purpose. I want to talk a little bit more about him here. The director is Rob Cohen. That name may sound familiar because he directed a lot of TV shows through the 90s and into the early aughts, but he also directed some decent movies. He's the director behind Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, and Fast and the Furious, the the original Fast and the Furious. And the Triple X movies. Walker well, one. Yeah, that's... So well, that's was the there list. one? Bo- so hold on. Well, was there a Fast and the Furious before Paul Walker? No, no. I mean, yeah, there was. The Fast and the Furious is a remake, but I'm I'm referring to the first one with Paul Walker and Vin Diesel. Oh, okay. Oh. But that's the other list I wanted to get to. Is like he's also a director of questionable movies, including Daylight, Triple X, Dragonheart. And the mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. I didn't even know that well, there was a mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Was that like, the, the, like a strict VHS? <laughs> <laughs> the mummy series actually went on a lot longer than any of us realized, but it was just a cash grab uh, for, I think, Disney. Yeah. Mm. I shouldn't know any of that. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Once again, John, you live up to your definition on our About Us page. No <laughs> reference is too far. despite the bad list for rob cohen and then the worrisome writers in the beginning i think we were all really surprised at how well this episode turned out let's get to the opening in the beginning of this episode we open up with sunny and rico they're working they've they've been working undercover clearly for a while they're talking to a big time counterfeiter so big time in fact that he doesn't even count the money he just weighs it because that's easier he prints so much money i'm kind of happy because the episode starts with a little soul with the music barrett strong's 
money that's what i want you know so you start out you got a little bit of old music going and it's just an incredible open yeah um, i mean i think there's a, a little bit of everything too. going yeah th- there's yeah, a couple of great yeah. posts too where sunny says the stuff is duckeen man and then the counterfeiter says he uses <laughs> stereoscopy and tubs replies that's molecular analyzation of matter through laser light read a book sometime the only thing that i got from the opener was that we finally learned Switek and Zito's first names. <laughs> we finally get to know, although I, I still don't refer to them in their first names. I don't call them Larry. I no, wait, forgot. they're Larry and Stan for sure. From now from now on, that's who they are. So well, I think the only problem I have with the open is a little small one, a little nitpicky. Isn't counterfeit money, isn't that the Secret Services territory? Like, mm, mm-hmm. like, isn't this out of Miami Vice's jurisdiction? Okay, but bit? like, Miami Vice is also taking on international drug cartels. Like, they're, they're <laughs> I feel like they easily blur the lines with, you know, FBI, CIA, IRS. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I'm pretty sure the uh, Secret Service is pretty quick on that. Like, you know, I've heard about them showing up for like one counterfeit hundred yeah exactly well this is this is like a big time bust right because they're in they're doing a review on the money they're meeting with Artie, who's the counterfeiter and his he has got a couple guards with him and then the entire miami vice team and the miami pd show up zito and switek are stationed across the street in like a conv convalescent home maybe and they're like posing as old people because that's where they've been stationed like to spy on what what what's happening there too and i will say it's eerie if you look up what Switek looks like, the guy, the actor who plays Switek now, it is eerily accurate how they made him look in this episode, in this open. Dominic, all they did was spray paint his hair gray. <laughs> <laughs> well, when the cops come pulling up, Artie runs over to a switch. He turns it on. The sprinkler's turned on, and we find out that it's actually gasoline. It's not water coming out of that. You... That must have takes, took quite a bit of finagling because I have a little bit of experience in plumbing. And I was like, holy crap, how did they get gasoline in the fire sprinklers? Like, that was that, that was what I was trying to figure out. Like, that, that that's, pretty, uh, that's a pretty tricky thing to do. But, Especially being under pressure um, like that. Like, that's, that's you're, yeah. you're real close to just straight up blowing up. Maybe that's why so many houses blow up or things blow up in Miami is that the sprinkler systems are full of gasoline. That might be true. <laughs> that might be true. But uh, And how come all of these busts always just go so sideways? Uh, one minute, they're doing the deal. Next thing you know, gasoline and fires is everywhere and well that i think that's what it's supposed to be in this open is that they weren't prepared for how prepared Artie was he flips on the sprinklers he lights a lighter maniacally laughs as he throws it into the gasoline to burn all of the evidence of the counterfeiting operation tubs and crockett have to shoot their way out they shoot both of the guards and zito and swipe that come running from across the street they run in and grab Artie while sunny and and Rico jump outside to, to be able to breathe. At the last second, Zito decides he's Zito just going to run in. Yeah, he goes all burning man and just runs in there, comes ju- busting out through the window with the with the counterfeit money so that they could save the case. He's just like, he barely makes it. And you can see in the beginning, like the setup for this, like because Switek is super concerned about Zito, he, more so than anyone else. And he goes running to his aid when he comes, when he busts out the window with the, with the cash. Zito says he burned up his fingertips really bad and he's able to rescue their prosecution on Artie. And then we go to the opening credits. Fun fact for the opening credits, there are two girls wearing Miami Vice staff jackets in it <laughs> really yeah. i didn't notice that it was huh. like some th- this is the only time that it happens oh yeah in the original broadcast of the episode two bikini clad girls walking down the steps in the intro are wearing miami vice staff jacket they removed oh. it from everything in syndication from the dvds everywhere oh, yeah well, i'm gonna have to go find that <laughs> When we come out of the credits, we go to driving Zito and Switek are driving home. Switek is driving Zito home, I should say. Zito's hands are all bandaged up from when he grabbed the the counterfeit cash. And one of my favorite parts, because I watch everything with subtitles on, and it's on the subtitles, it says, when Switek is driving, it says, singing nonsense. And I think that pretty much sums up <laughs> Switek. <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about the bus, and, and this is when we find out a little bit more information, because they mention it in the open. When they find out a little more information here, that Darlene, Zito's ex-girlfriend, 
is now Swatek's active girlfriend, and she's moving in with him. Which is really weird, right? I mean, I realize that that's, like, the point of the episode, that it's supposed to be strange, but for how much they're, like, madly in love with one another? Isn't that, like, bros have a code for that, don't they? This, it is a really strange that not only do they are they friends, but they work intimately together. They just really want to share all the same things. (laughs) It's as close, it's as close to be with one another as they can get. Right. (laughs) Let's talk about how the, how the episode goes all fight club with uh, Zito Snow being blown up and then Zwitek offering for him to come stay at his house down on Paper Street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but wait. There is a, there's actually a really good but total dad joke in there that they, they salvage the mailbox and Zwitek pulls it out and it's the gas bill. <laughs> yeah, they're like, so that's what the the gag is, is that because we have mentioned that when they pull up to Zito's house, his house is, and it's not it's not on fire. It's burned to the ground essentially. And the fire department said this like, oh, it's a gas line break, burned down his entire house, and and he lost his fish too, which is really sad. It makes me really hate Darlene later. Um, oh yeah. And mm-hmm. and then yeah, they he grabs his bill. So I take grabs his bill, opens not it up, and pulls the gas. That it out. wasn't Darlene. <laughs> uh, I'm not convinced that it wasn't Darlene burned his house down in the first place. Doing a left eye move on, on him. <laughs> she seems to be pretty crazy the further we go through the episode. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. The limited audience that's going to understand that reference. <laughs> <laughs> the crossover people, people out there. Old- the crossover of people old enough to know what you're talking about and also <laughs> See, left eye in was TLC. in TLC <laughs> and she was dating, dating Andre, Andre Risen, <laughs> who played for the Falcons. <laughs> so they go straight from Zito's place and they go back to Switek's place. So he lives in like uh, an apartment, probably a townhome. So, yeah, it looks like, like some that. kind of condo or something. Mm-hmm. They're walking up. A moving truck is moving in Darlene's stuff. And a, a giant moving truck is moving in her stuff. And then on top of that, Zwitek stuff is all outside and and we know from before that Zwitek likes Elvis but we hammer it home here Zwitek really likes Elvis oh, yeah. he's a whole shrine oh, yeah. Yeah, I think the only a... thing he likes more than Zito is Elvis <laughs> <laughs> and this bitch puts up a picture of Princess Di in the <laughs> place of that like are you serious that's instant <laughs> grounds for removal <laughs> it gets very the the episode gets very sitcommy in these scenes with Zito, Zwitek, and Darlene. It, mm-hmm. It's very Three's Company, and then like when he takes her in the room and they're arguing, and he's arguing with her about throwing his stuff out. It's very bam, boom, straight to the moon, mm-hmm. you know, type stuff. So it it just it got it got very sitcommy. And I'm glad they only did it in small portions. You're right, though. It was really weird. Um. Switek is like kind of there were a lot of moments where he's interacting with Darlene where I felt really uncomfortable like later on in in the episode when he comes home and she's like I'm not gonna like it like he sweeps her off of her feet and starts taking her into the bedroom and she's like fine but I'm not gonna I'm not I don't you know want this and he's like okay I'll be quick what about the what about the fact that Larry's constantly coming into their bedroom? Uh, And they clearly um, only have one. And then later in the episodes, why Tech can't get it up because Larry's not there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like I think that's why in that scene Jenny's talking about it's like he's trying to compensate for that time where you know he he failed to deliver. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on this scene where they first come in. There's the two highlights from here are there she's moving all of his stuff out. Darlene's being a total bitch too. She sees Zito and Zwitek's like, hey, look, he's coming to stay with us. His house burned down. And Zito says, I even lost my pet fish. And Darlene's like, that stupid fish, bitch. Yeah. And then they close the door and they start arguing. And she's like, he can't stay here. And blah, blah, blah. It's, good. it's, the, it's like you're saying, John, it's very sitcom The next day they mm. go to the, we, we come to the precinct this next morning. The ladies even got Zito a gift. They're waiting for, for Zito to come in to give him a gift. They're all joking about it's like it's like an inflatable house or Crockett says it's going to be really hard for him to live inside of that box. <laughs> Castillo. Uh, and I think this is the only real interaction we get with the ladies in this episode for the most part. I think at the ve- the, the, the very, very end at Noogie's wedding. Yes. Oh, yeah. You get there. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Oh, man. We've got so much ground left to cover. Uh, Castillo comes in. There, it, it sounds like they're kind of desperate for work. They start t- t- talking about this guy named Costaleta. And 
he's apparently he had been he had gone to Mexico, but something happened with him in Mexico, so now he's back in the U.S. He's a big runner of stolen goods, so they feel like they have an opportunity here. They could flip one one of the retailers, be able to get uh, undercover and break down Costaleta. They and then Zito volunteers like, hey, we know a guy, we we can go give it a shot. And Switek is not happy with that. Well, well, as far as I know, that they were previously on the case uh, investigating this Costaletto, but then he went to before he went to Mexico. So now he's back. Uh, Zito volunteers them, and then we get to meet Crazy Barry and his pet seal. <laughs> <laughs> before we get there, just want to cover that the gift that it is is a new pet fish. That's what the ladies got him because they you know, they care about Larry and they're they're very sad that he lost his fish. So he names it Harriet. And we need something to feed the seals. <laughs> <laughs> and or to Elvis as as Crockett suggests later in the episode. <laughs> so when the B yes. team when the B team are on their way in to go see Bonzo Barry, there is one Crazy Barry. <laughs> yeah. What one uh nice dig that I thought Larry had. Uh, on Darlene they're talking about her hair and he says what like Miss Hairspray 1985 but then he goes on to say like people spend less time raising their children (laughs) than she spends on her hair (laughs) you know and that's true with this episode is that two things one is consistently funny there's oh yeah we, yeah. we never get off on this tangent where it's like it goes from funny to creepy funny, which is oftentimes what happens with the Miami Vice. And two, or forceful th- funny, where it's yes. like, this is not funny. Like, you're trying way too hard. It was genuinely, like, slapstick funny the whole time. Yes. And then the other thing is that no matter what's happening in the episode, Zito and Switek are always talking about Darlene. That's a, that's their, all their conversations lead, lead back to her. Well, they come mm-hmm. walking into the stereo store to go meet Barry, and he's in the middle of filming a commercial i think he's dressed as like a space alien and he's got a sea lion and there's a stripper and a it's like uh, she's like in like an uncle sam she's a, but like hooker she's a costume? hooker she's yeah. a hooker we i mean they, they even confirm it later in the scene is in fact a hooker but i think he's being a little too direct with all the seal of approval jokes i mean i get the pun i was just thinking i would have went with our prices are so low they're fishy and then i would have fed the seal a fish i i think (laughs) well what's weird is like what's his angle because he's got the seal of approval but i was like when you first see him and i didn't see the seal right away i thought okay he's dressed like a like a space guy so maybe his prices are out of this world and then she's got that like star spangled banner looking outfit it's like is he just trying to cover all of his bases <laughs> i don't yeah, i just there's too much going on i think we need to focus on the prices are so low they're fishy angle and i think we could really get more sales for crazy barry <laughs> here you know well barry's played by mark lynn baker who if you're a fan of 80s stuff he's uncle larry in perfect strangers yeah and he was on a slew of different TGIF shows uh, as far as appearances are concerned. It's also the Moonlighting Connection that we love, Everything Miami Vice. And he also went to Yale and kind of started his career on on stage in a Broadway version of the Doonesbury comic strip, which hmm. uh, I thought was interesting. Yeah, you know, he, he seemed... I remember in the late 80s and then through the 90s, seeing him all the time. And then just one day he was gone. So I was, I was actually kind of surprised. I had totally forgotten about him. And then when I saw him, I was like, oh, Perfect Strangers. We're doing a podcast on the wrong show. We should be doing a podcast about Perfect Strangers. <laughs> 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 well, what what brings Zito and Switek here is that they're going to try and work an angle uh, undercover. They're going to go talk to Barry and see if they can set up him to buy stolen goods, flip him as a retailer to get to Costaletta. But the stripper or the hooker recognizes Zito and Switek, which Switek asked Zito's like, "Hey, ha- didn't we pick her up before?" And Zito's like, "No," because Zito's just having—he's just having a bad time. He can't remember anything. His house burned down. He lost his fish. His ex-girlfriend's living with his best friend. So, of course, they did pick her, pick her up. She recognizes them and tips off to Barry in front of them, like, "You don't want to buy anything from these guys because these guys are cops." When they're leaving there, they go sit in the car. They have a little bit of little tip and then they start thinking about well who do we know that can move or is buys and moves stolen goods and only one person can come to mind the Noogman. The Noogie. Of course, they leave straight from there. They go to see Noogie and Noogie does not disappoint. They go to him. He's at a strip club. 
<laughs> when we come in, he's having a bachelor party. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because he's he's marrying what Tits, Tits McGee or whatever her name is. Ample, ample, ample Annie. Yeah, ample amp- Annie. Ample Annie. So when they come in, he's wearing aviator goggles and a leather aviator hat. He's laying flat on a gurney while two girls push him around, and he's pretending to sh- be an airplane shooting at another girl as she <laughs> runs around the strip club. <laughs> I just really want to live Nuggie's life. Like, it just looks so interesting. <laughs> then he's Where did got a he get the goggles and the old school leather helmet? I don't know. He's got a backpack on, too, like, like it's a parachute. He throws part of a parachute up at him. When he yeah. hops off the gurney, he's like, he throws the parachute up in the air. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he, he he comes around the corner. He says, they run into it. The, he runs into the B-team. And he goes, oh, shit, the 5-0. The Nook Man, fearless, faster, flying fool, bailing out Jack. And then he th- pretends like he's jumping out of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Barnett is just so my, good. I know. And my favorite quote from this scene is, let the noogie boogie. Dude, he's <laughs> oh, just no. the king of those one-liners. Uh, mine, is, mine is when he says, uh, give me give me some R-E-S-P-C-P. <laughs> 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 well, we see, though, for a brief second, they tell him, hey, we know... Yeah, like, you should help us. And he's like, no, I'm not into that kind of stuff anymore. And they're like, okay, let's go back to your place and see what the, what the serial numbers are on your registry. And he he drops the character for a few seconds. You can see, like, he's really tired of dealing with the vice team. He's like, come on, man. Like, why why you guys always got to do this to me? And you realize, like, for just a brief second, like, they really take advantage of him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're constantly putting I mean, him in on. danger. Like, and the guy's getting married, man. Like... Lay off. The, he concedes like he's going to help. They leave. So the B team leaves and we cut to a man stalking around in the bushes and he's going to break into this door. And you can tell, you can tell right away who this person is. So excited because of the light reflecting off of his thick glasses. <laughs> it's bumbling crook that is Izzy Moreno. Yay. And my Izzy notes Moreno are just oh my, robbing oh my a God. pet store. <laughs> <laughs> there are, are some great quotes Noogie in here too. And Izzy in this episode, like I want every episode from now on to be Noogie and Izzy. <laughs> They're the best team yes. ever. Of course, it's Izzy. He has a crowbar. He tries to break it in the door. He drops the crowbar. Then he gets in. He knocks a bunch of stuff over inside of there. He goes in. You know, he's like he's the he worst crook that, ever. He, he, he claims that he be... is there. Hold on. He claims that he is there to teach the parrots how to be to speak English so they can get their citizenship. Yeah, he says. <laughs> yeah, he says he's gonna give them their. He's gonna teach them a different English to, so they can meet their language requirement and it can help them with his migration card. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, and eventually... Why is he robbing a pet store? <laughs> <laughs> How much money do you think pet store could have? So I don't know. The, Ever. the B team are, they're pressing, they're pressing on him, right? And he eventually cries. He says, I'm a man of no convictions. <laughs> but he's, ta- I mean, he's talking about how he's been indicted, but never convicted. But it's like a nice double play. Like, it's so nice that everyone but the actual squad seems so talented at riffing. <laughs> like, <laughs> Noogie and Izzy can both get it going with that, like, that double meaning or, like, just let just let them go. I was enjoying it. But at this point in the episode, I'm a little confused at how the parrot thief is connected to the big time fence. I don't know why the B team even knew he was going to be there. So they were just almost like they set it up. Like maybe they called, like they let him somehow let him know that it was like it was an easy target. That way he'd show up there. So that's the only question I have on this scene is like, how I'm did just... they know that Izzy was going to be there? Yeah, and I mean, it, did Char- did Noogie tell tell them that he was going to be there? Because I mean, they already employed Noogie, so I just I I, I didn't understand why all of a sudden they knew Izzy was going to be there, and also what his role was going to be. I mean, well, obviously that... it's very entertaining later, but. I, I just right. well, didn't but that seem becomes, necessary for the plot. But that becomes one of the issues later in what is quite possibly one of the best scenes in that breakfast scene. Well, that's that's coming up next. Because we have a, they set them up, right? They, for, yep. for them to both not know that each other is working it as the lead. But they ask them both to put feelers out. Yeah, yeah. So we have a brief scene where we see Costaletta for the first time. It's his place. He's, he operates out of a yacht. We meet a very 
fantastic bodyguard with a great chin strap beard and a Raleigh finger swirled mustache. Oh my God. <laughs> Why does he not have a big old time bike that he rides around on? <laughs> The only thing we get seen other than the old timey bodyguard. So because later on, when his other bodyguards are walking around on the boat and they're in those like high waisted, but like they're like booty short swimmer shorts, and they look like they could be doing some calisthenics. <laughs> With the old rounded barbell. <laughs> yes, he's my favorite henchman. Eggs so... and steak and steak and eggs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Castelletta, he comes off as like, a, like legit. He gets on the phone with that guy and he just starts breaking down like, okay, like you don't want to pay me? Well, how about I also like, I think I know where your kid goes to school, what kind of car your wife drives, where you live. Like he's legit kind of scary, seems to have his crap together, which is a stark contrast to the child that we find later in the episode. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Then we jump to, we go back to Zwitek's place. Darlene and Zwitek are laying in bed. Zito comes out of apparently the only bathroom in the place. And he's just in his tidy <laughs> whities like the underwear. bikini cut underwear. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't want to spend I'm too just... much detail on this on this exact yeah. scene because I, it's... I, I ahead, think John. I can summarize it for us. Basically, Darlene's whisking it to Zwitek's ears, how he can uh, do so much better than Zito as a partner he could even be police chief and police chiefs. Do you know what? Do you know what police chiefs get, Dominic? Uh, they leave it up to us to infer, but I'm pretty sure police chiefs get blowjobs. <laughs> so <laughs> the scene ends with Zito cock blocking Zwitek. Yeah, he puts on. They watch TV for a little bit with Elvis, and then he's like, um, he's doing his laundry in a bucket. So very, very Zito. You get reminded pretty off this episode is that he is very much a single guy he lives a single guy lifestyle which is cramping the style of zwitek and darlene but the next morning mm. everyone's up and they're having breakfast zwitek is cooking eggs for everyone there and they're sitting inside of a little tiny kitchenette and they're having breakfast and there's a knock at the door and the door just flies open and in comes Noogie and Izzy. And they come flying in, <clears throat> arguing over who has jurisdiction in this case. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, uh, Izzy immediately sees the, the little mini TV and puts on Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> and they just sit like a happy family. Darlene at this point has stormed out. Because well, because she's because just wait, 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 bitch. Wait. You're skipping over the most important part. This is the episode where the ward comes down hard on the beaver. <laughs> Also, Dar Dar Darlene runs away because Noogie comes up and starts feeling up on it. It's like, how do you get your hair so good in the morning? Do you even sleep? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think that for someone so obsessed with her hair that she would take the compliment. But no, Darlene just continues to be a total bitch. What eventually happens here is that they Noogie and Izzy are suggesting that they go talk to Barry again. Zito's wife is like, hey, look, we've already been down that road. And Noogie's like, no, nah, man, you got to try it from a new direction. I enjoyed this scene so much that I hope that they would create a spinoff Noogie and Izzy <laughs> show featuring Zito and Zwitek. That's how much I liked this scene. Yeah, that, yes. that Zito and Zwitek would just make an appearance every once in a while. Like, yes. Noogie yeah. and Izzy alongside. So when we get the normal team alongside the b team i can't stand the b team like they're not enough to compensate for how horrible the b team is for me <laughs> but with izzy and noogie i'm like i will take the b team every day of the week i'm fine with that as long as it means <laughs> See, that I'm i get them. like a mod squad style show where noogie and I izzy are the focus and then like zito and zy tech are just handlers yeah so let's let's get to the setup here's what the deal is the b team goes and they meet with sunny and crockett uh, sunny and crockett they meet with crockett and tubs and they have their picking up some vcrs they load them up into a limo then they drive back over to where the bug buster van is inside of there is izzy and noogie they're handcuffed inside of the van because they don't want them to steal their surveillance equipment so there but are two important things that happen there though um tubs and crockett offer to go with them to help them out and they are quick to say no no like we have it don't you don't need to come with us because nobody knows that they're using noogie and izzy which they later get later get their hands slapped for. So they're being super secretive about it. And uh, Noogie drops a phenomenal line when they open that door to the bug van, where he says, "I didn't know this was going to be a sequel to Roots." 
<laughs> I didn't catch that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No Charlie Barnett. <laughs> I'm telling you, and the more I expo- uh, the more I'm exposed to Charlie Barnett, the more I see why Dave Chappelle lists him as one of his biggest influences. So they- you could see you could see um, Dave Chappelle in some of his movie roles where he's basically doing a Charlie Barnett impression. What the plan is now, and th- this is what they go do: Izzy and Noogie go talk to Barry. They have a they bring in all the VCRs. It's like look like. Here's a sample of our work. If we have 2,000 more of them at the warehouse, Barry is obviously skeptical, but it's like, we're leaving these here as a good faith measure. And if you don't trust us, then go, go to hell, basically. But if you do want to do business with us, you can come down to the warehouse on 35th and see all the stuff that we have. And then they do the best timed walk out of the warehouse ever. They like walk down to the where it turns the corner and they both stop and turn the corner at the exact same time and walk <laughs> out of the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> they already have chemistry. Like, this is perfect. And outside, Zito and Zwitek, they're listening in, and then they're having a conversation <clears throat> of their own. And this is one of those times where, like, every conversation they have is about Darlene. And Zito, Zwitek asks Zito, like, hey, do you ever think about the future? And Zito basically tells him, like, hey, I've had this co- this co- conversation with Darlene before, too. Like, I could become governor one day. And Zwitek's like, oh, she only said I could become mayor. <laughs> Because <laughs> Zwitek's a little slow. <laughs> then Zwitek asked Zito if he could find somewhere else to crash tonight because he wants to bone up on Darlene. Yeah, yeah, he pushes pretty hard on him finding something else to do tonight. I mean, I guess it's true because it's such a tiny place and, you know, he wants to have a private moment with his Well, yeah, Darlene girlfriend. won't do anything with Zito around, so he just wants Zito to not be around so that Darlene stops pulling... A temper tantrum. And before we so, get there, let's jump I to start Crockett getting... accusing the. Then we jump to a scene of Crockett accusing the janitor of drinking his bourbon. <laughs> Another reason why people don't like Crockett around this police station. Yeah, we have a brief stopover where Barry's just telling Costaletta that he met some new people. Barry's really suspicious, but Costaletta's being like, "Whatever, bro, I'm out sunning." And this is where we see the other bodyguard and <laughs> him and. <laughs> And the, and the first bodyguard are doing weights and staying on top of each other's shoulders. <laughs> They're just rolling around with monocles, top hats on bikes with giant front wheels. This is so good. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I'm a scene ahead. I'm, a, I'm, I'm where Crockett's at the police station. Well, now, so, yeah. and, then, and then we go to the precinct, and Zito's there just hanging out at the precinct, talking to Harriet, his new fish. And Which is that, actually... A really humanizing it, scene for Zito. Like, I appreciated this because we do only really get to ever see, like, the slapstick kind of nature of Zito and Switek, and we don't get much nuance with them. So I feel like they were trying to deliver that more, at least with Zito in this episode, and they did a really good job. This scene especially. Yeah, but this is the scene where Crockett accuses the janitor of drinking his bourbon. Yeah, he comes walking in. The first thing he does is he accuses him of drinking his bourbon. He doesn't even say hi. Uh, <laughs> yes. Once again, don't know why everyone hates Crockett. <laughs> and he, he sees Zito sitting in the room. He goes in there and talks to him. They have like pretty endearing moment where they're talking. Like, Zito saying how concerned he is for Zwitek and that Darlene is taking advantage of him because Zwitek, although he's a big guy and can crush your head, I think that's he says something along those lines, but he's actually really gentle and wants to cook your eggs right. And yeah, so and he, he has a soft touch. He's kind of like Letty from uh, of Mice and Men. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give Zwitek any bunnies. He'll, he'll crush them. <laughs> Crockett offers for Zito to stay at his place. He can come here and bring Harriet to Elvis. And you see his look of shock <laughs> on Zito's face when he says that. And he's like, no, I'm good. I'll, I, I got stuff to do. I'll just hang out here. And uh, that's the end of that scene. We go back to Zwitek's place. And we hear from the outside that Zwitek and Darlene are having sex. And I'm like, oh, my God. If there was ever something that could be worse than a tub sex scene, <laughs> it would be us. And we get so close a couple of times I, I get so scared I have my finger on like the fast forward button just waiting <laughs> for it to start but luckily it never it, actually happens 
Because if you thought that Philip Michael Thomas had a carpet for a chest, for a chest <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you what. <laughs> Switek's a regular Robin Williams under the clothes, okay? <laughs> it it would appear, though, we are saved from, uh, by the fact that Switek apparently can't get it up without Zito in the other room listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says he's thinking about Zito. He feels bad that he asked Zito to leave. We make a we jump from there luckily and then that there's an argument starts you hear something crash darlene getting so bad she throws something we have a quick stopover at the precinct the next morning the b team is explaining to castillo what they're doing and castillo backhands them saying our street people are for information they're not part of the squad you need to cut them loose so then the b team goes to fire izzy and noogie who Back are once club. again in strip club with ample annie and noogie's having a conversation with ample annie over the fact that she wants to spend their honeymoon at disney world because she wants mickey uh <laughs> whereas yeah. noogie compares the situation saying what is this grade then the b team shows up and they basically tell him like hey you guys are done we can't use you anymore and they pay him 50 bucks that's it right that, they're like yeah that's way short changed but, but no it, worries because noogie and izzy decide that they're gonna take matters into their own hands um <laughs> and it's an idea that at first i was waiting for him to say i know a place where we could steal a bunch of yeah but instead yeah so izzy this is izzy's idea Noogie's just along, the, just on board. Izzy says, like, we still have a meeting with Barry, and I know what we can do. Which, to Izzy's credit, he gets Hostaletta. He nails him, like, on the head. Because everyone else just laughs this off, sing, thinking, like, oh, yeah, okay, a cement truck, sure. Even when they meet with Crazy Barry, uh, and they tell him about it, he's like, no way. And he calls Hostaletta later and says, I don't think these guys are legit. And now they want to sell a, they want to sell you a cement truck. And Hostaletta goes, And like, I love their response. Costaletta. Costaletta's response is, can they get me a fire truck? <laughs> and then he, he goes off on this whole tangent about how his parents only gave him the wooden the wooden trucks growing up or something like that. And like, he hates the wooden trucks. He sounds like a petulant child. Like maybe oh, yeah. he He'll is spit now on those an wooden idiot. trucks. Yeah. I mean, just so fucking random. And he is so pumped about the idea of buying this cement truck. It and this moves re really fast. We see the cement truck. They set this deal up with Barry. Barry calls Costaletta. He's like, absolutely. I want that fucking truck. Set this deal up. Now, Izzy and Nookie need to still steal the truck. They haven't stolen it yet. Izzy just took Nookie to go see the truck. And so now we go back to the construction site. In the middle of the day, while, every, while all the construction workers are still there, they're going to steal this truck. They're inside of the cab of the truck, and Noogie's, like, looking out through the window while Izzy's trying to hotwire the truck. Yeah. After a few minutes so, of Izzy playing around with the hot wiring, he finally gets the truck to start. And now Izzy's going to drive them to freedom to sell this truck. Meanwhile, the truck just starts, and off. nobody questions it. Until the calamity starts, and they back up, fill a convertible full of cement, and then take out all the Portage Johns on the way through the fence. <laughs> <laughs> like who then parks, people notice. Who parks their uh their I am convertible going, behind a freaking cement truck? Like, I don't you do know, that? but I'm going to be completely honest with you. As someone that works in the construction industry, they wouldn't even have had to hotwire it because typically we leave the keys in the truck so people can move it. Construction site. <laughs> It's so it, it easier than you think. Yes, extremely. So, and those things are made for people who barely graduated high school to be able to drive. So this is kind <laughs> of believable. <laughs> true, true. And they do cause a lot of mayhem before they before they get out of there. And they have a little celebration. But this is when the bad stuff starts to happen. Now that Zeno and Zwitek aren't working with Noogie and Izzy, they show up back to Barry. They catch him as he's leaving his store. They're like, hey, you know those guys? We, we know that you're in possession of stolen goods. Remember those guys that, that were offering to sell you VCRs? Barry's like, they're cops? And they're like, yeah. They don't say yes. They just say, like, we just know that you're in possession of stolen goods. And we want a meeting with Costaletta or you're going to prison for being in possession of stolen goods. Barry concedes and says that he'll set up a meeting for tomorrow. Then we go over to where they're actually now we jump to so where just... Noogie and Izzy are going to sell the truck. And I, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh my God, they're going to get Izzy and Noogie killed. Yes. Right. So it jumps to Ca Costaletta is like bouncing like 
a small child <laughs> in the front seat of the room. room. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's like of the cement moving truck. the steering wheel. He's pretending to talk into the CB. He's jumping yeah. up and down on the seat. And he tells the guy, you know, hey, pay him, pay him. Like I want to, like I want to get this done. I'm, I'm ready to buy this thing. Like he's just, he's so excited. And one of the guys gets the call from Crazy Barry, tipping him off that they shouldn't be working with Izzy and Noogie because they are undercover. They're cops. And so the team turns against him. Yeah, and it's just, I feel so bad for those two because they, they work so hard. They It took so much work to get to this point where they were actually going to make a whole bunch of money selling that truck. And now it's just with the incompetence of the yeah, BT uh, put them into jeopardy now. And, and I love the fact that it went completely away from trying to bust Costaletta to just, hey, we can make a crap load of money selling this cement truck to this guy. <laughs> so it jumps to the guys. They're tied up. They're they're trying to spit whatever game they can on well, Costaletta's boat. True, but just one uh, second uh, before, before we get there, because we do have a stop off at Zwitek's place. Oh, we, that's right. Yeah, so Zwitek comes home, and he, he comes in, and Darlene's on the phone. And you hear her talking on the phone, and she says, she's talking to someone first, she's like, yeah, I miss you too. Oh, oh, Stan, he's just a friend. And then Zwitek comes in and she goes like, oh, what are you doing home so early? And she hangs up the phone really fast. So she's clearly cheating on him too. I can't stand her. She's so awful. <laughs> well, yeah. we don't have to deal with her anymore because Zwitek decides to tell her to take a walk. Which yeah. is so weird and because that- Zito comes busting in and is like he interrupts them again right which yeah sure whatever what's annoying but um so like i can understand her initial annoyance but then he's like we got to go like they got they got noogie they got izzy like we have to go and stan gets up and he and he gets ready to go and she's like if you leave and he's like this is my job and she's like you can have other jobs if you leave with him right now like i'll be gone like what the what the hell <laughs> exactly and i was i was so i was actually happy we got here because right before then zwitek throws her on the bed she says that line like uh this is so tawdry you can do it but i'm not gonna like it and he's like it doesn't matter how be fast and he jumps on top of her and i'm like oh my god oh my god oh my god <laughs> <laughs> but luckily zito comes running in at the last second right so, so he, he hands her a picture died. of like if princess died i, I would have yeah. said dolly parton i had no idea <laughs> Well, that's offensive. (laughs) (laughs) How dare you, sir? One is I just assumed Elvis, Dolly. I I just made more sense. I don't know. And and Darlene says, "Hey, if you leave, you're. I'm not going to be here when you come back." He gives her a little salute, like "See you later." And that's the end of Darlene as they go run off to go save Izzy and Noogie. We go to Costaleta's boat. Zito and Zwite. Show up at the docks as the boats get ready to pull out, and we get a little bit of least action heroes from them. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little worried that Stan wasn't going to clear that jump, not going to lie. <laughs> and this is, Jenna, what you were talking about is that Noogie and Izzy are dropping every line they can to try and get out of whatever punishment is about to come down. Well, what's so funny is that Izzy's like, Go ahead and try me. I beat every kind of interrogation there is. And then he starts listing off random things and it goes way off. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. like foreign, domestic, psychological. I have, <laughs> I, I have the list here. He says electrical, mechanical, psychological, <laughs> philosophical, <laughs> European, <laughs> domestic, <laughs> and commercial. What? I'll take then, commercial for then, a no, hundred. And then no, Noogie, so he's like, so I'm never going to talk. Like, whatever. And Noogie next one was like, man. I talk for a living. I will talk about anything and everything and nothing. Whatever you want from me. So what I love about this scene is that it ends up in very B-team fashion. Where they shoot a couple guys, bust in to try and save the day, and Noogie and Izzy already have Costaletta at gunpoint. So it's like like they don't even really fully save the day. You know? No, they, they caused enough action to happen. That way Izzy and Noogie can get the upper hand on Costaletta. But yeah, see, the B team the... specialty just causing a distraction. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but that's why, I mean, honestly, their their resilience, Izzy and Noogie's resilience, is the only reason why they're able to be in contact with the Vice team and still be alive. Everyone else that comes into contact with the Vice team is dead, but it's only because Especially they're so the good at Especially the way that they out themselves. them all the time. Oh, yeah. Now we get to 
the last scene of the episode. They've captured Costaletta. We got the police story out of the way. That's not what we're all interested in, though. And we've summed up the Darlene story. That's all done. Darlene is now out of both of their lives. We go back to the strip club. Yeah. And then Nogman is getting married. So let's finish up this story arc and make sure there's a happy ending for Nogi. So oh, Nogi yeah, and Nogi's is, having an, ama- an amazingly 80s wedding. Right, like he's incredibly nervous and he's waiting on Izzy. And Izzy comes running in at the last second and he's like, like, you didn't tell me that pawn shop had an alarm system, man. He's broken in and gotten the ring for this sacred event. <laughs> uh, <laughs> meanwhile, Nogi is in what appears to be a foil shirt. On the set of breaking. <laughs> I, I like the, the, the captain's hat. Well, and the whole the whole vice team shows up, though. And I thought that was a very nice gesture. The ladies, the oh, yeah. our duo, the B team, they're all there. They all show up. I don't think Martin's there, but everyone else is there. And yeah, then we yeah. See... I don't think Crockett speaks. He might be drunk already. <laughs> <laughs> well, then well, we see our darling Ample Annie, who makes what I now have goals okay like i clearly did my wedding wrong because her walk down the aisle was uh, amazing it felt, it felt like it was a madonna music video that right? that's what this was so she's in a couple layers of what is that it's like that that fish netty uh goes underneath dresses to give dresses like volume well why am i asking you of the three of us I'm the one that she's wearing the material like four skirts that goes under it to add bulk and she's got like like a wrap around top situation and gloves and she's she starts walking down the aisle and stops and starts doing a dance <laughs> and noogie <laughs> looks like he's having a fucking stroke <laughs> he has the most intense this face and like can't handle himself and then Ample become- and he's clearly a workaholic i'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> and then as we end the episode, we just pan back and there's the B team, Zeno and Twitek are standing in the back. And they basically just say, like, best friends forever, right? And they're like, yeah, best friends forever. And then the, and then the scene, the episode ends. So good. Let's We spent some extra time on this episode. Let's get over and talk about the music from this episode. Which I, there's a couple songs here that are worth talking about. Yeah, music today. Um, we have a few choices and then something, uh, a little extra note about a guest star that I'm going to include in the music section. So let's get started with the very beginning of the episode, a song by Barrett Strong called Money, That's What I Want, off of his 1959 album, Oh, I Apologize. It's an old one. It's an old one. And actually, Barrett Strong is very famous for writing songs with producer Norman Whitfield all throughout the Motown era. So, but this particular song is, uh, well, it's kind of funny. Written by Barry Gordy, who is the, you know, like the uh, originator of Motown as far as he owned the Motown label. So, and it was his first hit on his label Tamla that w- that he had before he started the Motown label. So Barrett Strong insists that he actually co-wrote the song. And there's even a little bit about how three years after the song, he was originally on the copyright of the song, but three years later, his name magically disappeared. Sketchy. So, yes, but the song has been covered by the Beatles, the Stones, and the Doors. But like I alluded to earlier... Strong would later join up with producer Norman Whitfield and would write songs such as Heard It Through the Grapevine for Mm. Marvin Gaye, War by Gladys Knight and the Pips, Papa the Rolling Stone, and Just My Imagination for The Temptations. So, wow. Barrett Strong would, would, would write plenty of songs after money. But yeah, there's still some question about whether or not he actually co wrote that with Barry Gordon. So it leads us to the other music in the episode. Both songs by Elvis Presley, one in Treat Me Nice off of his 1957 Jailhouse Rock album, which was also featured in the film Jailhouse Rock and debuted at number 27 on the Hot 100. And then Elvis Presley's song Rubbernecking off of his 1969 album Don't Cry Daddy, which is 
featured in Elvis Presley's film Change of Habit and also used in a series of 1984 Denny's commercials, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to throw that in there. So, but that debuted at number six on the Hot 100. And so I'm just going to rush through Elvis real quick because I think we all know who Elvis is. It's just I'm going to list a few interesting facts that maybe you didn't know about Elvis. Elvis, rather than talk a thing that you probably do. Survived the 1936 Tupelo Gainesville tornado outbreak, which featured a five F5 tornado. Which, from what I remember from the movie Twister, it means it's very big. <laughs> So, Elvis's <laughs> father was arrested for and jailed for eight months for knitting or forging a check when wait, Elvis wait. was a child. Knitting a check? <laughs> how does one knit That a is check? specifically how they wrote that on Wikipedia. And I have never heard of that phrase either, but I wanted to use it. We're just learning all night all kinds of fun and interesting phrases this weekend. <laughs> exactly. So, um, and then Buttons. as Elvis was employed as a truck driver, he, he was... He tried out for the lead singer of a band and was told to keep driving truck because, quote, you're never going to make it as a singer. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Swing and a miss. Yikes. So the very last thing I want to talk about in this segment today is the guy that played John Costaletta is Johnny Vatos Fernandez. And he was the drummer for the band Oingo Boingo. Why are we talking about such a silly, silly uh, band? That just doesn't seem to have any significance, but it'll make more sense the more random this, uh, more random things I list about this band. So this band was originally founded in 1972 as the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo, and was a performance <laughs> art. It was a performance. Art. Art group Hernandez the band in 1978 when then frontman Richard Elfman shifted the band's interest toward more of a Frank Zamba theater comedy troupe and the band would continue on that style until Richard Elfman's younger brother brother Danny Elfman would take over as lead singer. Danny Elfman. Why do I recognize that Yeah, why that does that name? name sound familiar? So this is where this band becomes important because Danny Elfman takes over as lead and Danny Elfman is famous because he has pretty much written every score for Tim, every Tim Burton movie. He mm. also is the creator of the Simpsons theme. Wow. And he, he's just a, a, he's a film composer, you know, I mean, everything, even now, Avengers Age of Ultron, he did the score for. Oh, whoa. Well, Danny Elfman is like, he wins every year, he wins like Emmys for the music he does for these songs. But what is even more interesting is about the Oingo Boingos kind of, the, some of the random things that they were involved in. So, one, the name Oingo Boingo is inspired by an episode of Amos and Andy uh, that featured a secret society called the Mystic Knights of the Sea. They were on an episode of The Gong Show, which they won in 1976. Their one really big hit or was Weird Science, written for the movie, uh, the John Hughes movie, Weird mm -hmm. Science. That's where I know them. So, but by then, they were just going by Boingo. They had dropped the <laughs> Oingo part because that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they also... So did the song Good Goodbye in the Fast Times at Ridgemont High soundtrack. Wow. But they were also featured as a band, as extras in the movie, the 1977 movie, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, was also the band in the movie Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield. So, yeah. Boingo, Oingo Boingo has deep reaching roots. Yes, yes. More than you know. So they are more than just a ridiculously named band. <laughs> well, that's, um, that, you know, every once in a while there's a very enlightening version of music, John. And I think I totally forgot everything you talked about before Oingo Boingo. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Well, let's, uh, let's head on over and talk about our f final thoughts to this episode. All right, John, start us off. You know, I think we all had a lot of fun with this episode. What are your final thoughts? My 
couple of thoughts is that uh, initially when, it, when I saw it was going to be a heavy B-team episode, I was really nervous. And I was extremely surprised and very pleasantly surprised that it was actually, more importantly, one of the funniest episodes of Miami Vice so far. I didn't think there could be a successful B-team heavy episode at this point but apparently all it takes is izzy moreno and and noogie it just brings everything up a notch so i i thought it was the funniest episode we've probably seen so far and i really hope for more izzy and noogie pairing together because i think they make just a great team absolutely jenna what 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 are your final thoughts because i think that you're going to mention the same thing that maybe izzy and noogie should be a regular Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would suck in all of John's comments. That was more or less what I was going to bring to this. Um, I really, really enjoyed this episode. It was so funny for me. And um, I appreciate that more. And I like like I had mentioned earlier, it felt like like it was actually just genuinely funny and the dialogue was interesting and not in a forceful way, which I'm wondering if that has something to do with the the guy that you mentioned earlier with uh, Joel Cerno and him being involved in it that like I just really like his dialogue and I, I like the I like the stories that they tell like I think that they're a little bit more airy but they get a, they still get police work done but it's more about character interaction uh, and I think that that's something that Izzy and Noogie do especially well uh, that they can kind of be placed in any situation and make it something that's wonderful so I'm looking forward to more of it. I would like very much for them to become more involved in future episodes. Absolutely. And I'm going to stand on a little bit of a soapbox here with my final thoughts on this episode. This is a classic Miami Vice episode. And earlier this week, I was talking to the super fan that I live with for Miami Vice. And she was talking about the end of the show that at by season three, my- Michael Mann has di- di- disappeared. The main showrunner has become dick wolf and the show becomes extremely serious at this point in the run of miami vice what no, makes no, no. my well at this point what makes miami vice different is that it can take it cannot be so serious all the time that it can be funny it can induce funny characters noogie and izzy making routine appearances are an integral part to the miami vice experience that the b team even though we don't always like their humor that there is humor in the show and my soapbox stance is what i think is wrong with tv now you look at shows like csi or criminal minds or any of the other detective cop slash like chicago fire any of those types of shows it is the most disturbing stuff you will see on tv Every episode is about some mass murdering person who like eats human bodies or does all kinds of whack stuff. And every episode, every week is super serious and really disturbing. And I really like the fact that Miami Vice was able to take a moment, step back from always being so serious and have a fun episode. And I think that's something that's missing from TV now. So, and that's good. That's the end of the show for this week. This was again, season one, episode 19, the episode titled made for each other. I think we can all agree. We had a lot of fun with this episode we hope you enjoyed it we would love to hear your feedback you can find us on twitter facebook and tumblr at go with the heat you can go to our website go with the heat.com you can find out all the ways you can subscribe to the show you can su- subscribe to us personally and any other ways you can find us on social media you can email us go with the heat at gmail.com we recently just started posting our episodes on youtube as well so if rss isn't your thing or maybe you know someone that'd be interested in the show but the rss really isn't something that they're interested in you can find all of our shows on our youtube channel go with the heat as a fantastic even though we don't do an actual video component it's just the audio we have a great visualizer that's an open source tool that you can find out more information on our website with that as well if you're interested in we are also now on stitcher so if you like to use that app we're available there as well you may have also noticed that a new show started popping up in your feed called this week in vice that is a quick three minute look at what was happening when miami vice was king on tv what else was happening during the 1980s i've put up two episodes of that covering the last two weeks and you'll see another one in your feed for this one those are also appearing on stitcher itunes google play and on our youtube channel i would love to hear your feedback on that show as well if you'd like that to continue to happen we appreciate you for listening as always thank you thank you thank you for subscribing and we'll see you all next week bye pals and with that goodbye